the end of feminism, I have to smile, because it's fun being proven wrong, and then finding myself arguing for philosophical and social change. If you would have asked me two years ago to write about anti-feminism I would have imagined a bunch of right-winged fundamentalist Christians, carrying signs, telling women to go home, and take your damn shoes off, but this could not be further from the truth. I know there are, isolated examples of this, but for the most part this is a fiction generated by feminist propaganda to justify themselves. The truth is a little more mundane, and a lot more interesting. Any philosophically inclined person, should investigate the issue for themselves, it's not hard, and once you get past the rhetoric you can see the humor in it. I have provided some links in the info of this video to get you started. If you're a moderately evolved male, or female, you have no problem with a woman's right to vote or a woman's right to choice. In fact you will commit, but, remember the whole balance equation thing in math, and the whole there is no such thing as a free lunch in physics well this is also true in social politics as well. And if you don't balance your equation well you get a problem. And this is the kind of problem that feminism is attempting to cover up. I want the rights, but I don't want the responsibilities. I want to be listened to, but I don't want to have to listen. It takes time, and there's a lot of misinformation, and censorship, but the third rail of feminism is being derailed, and men women and children will be better off for it. I found myself in the middle of the feminist debate when I started investigating Matt Dillahunt's defense of atheism plus. I was new to YouTube, I mean I knew about it, but I was not taking it seriously as a medium of idea exchange, but one thing I felt strongly about was the free exchange of ideas, and one thing Matt was advocating was a type of censorship, and he mentioned one censory guy by the YouTube handle Thunderfoot. Well, to be fair Thunderfoot was out for there, and he was pissed because he had been kicked off Freethought blogs, for questioning the feminist position on Freethought blogs. In researching, Thunderfoot, it appeared to me that he understood the feminist issues better than PZ Myers did, and he understands the rhetoric of the dialogue better than most on YouTube. Then again, maybe I was missing something, because this guy seems rational, and I did not detect any indication of psychopathy that Matt seemed certain of. To be honest with you I was looking to confirm Matt's point, so maybe this guy really is a sociopath and I am just not seeing it, yet the YouTuber WiseApple confirmed for me that Thunderfoot was not wrong, and his position was sound. From the WiseApple I learned about Karen Strawn, aka Girl Right What, an oracle of sound reasoning. At this time I also learned about the amazing atheist, perhaps the only one that might have earned his reputation, because he is not known for censoring his mouth, but his points are often valid but his lack of cause did land him in hot water with free thoughts blogs, for telling someone that he hoped that they would get raped again, alone with a string of over-the-top visceral Quentin Tarantino vulgarities. I don't care what your cause is, it's going to happen, someone is going to lose their cool and, say dumbass, mean-spirited things, we are human after all, but should they be censored for life, or should we all agree that what they did was wrong and then learn from it? Accountability is a big issue, and I am all for accountability, but then that is the ultimate price for censorship, the lack of accountability. We need to be able to make mistakes, and then learn from it. We want people to retract their statements, and admit their mistakes, which the amazing atheist did do. We need to learn for those mistakes. Censoring people does not accomplish this goal. In a practical sense this is not always possible. But everyone is better off if this is the exception rather than the rule. Calling people names, and censoring without so much as a rebuttal is simple scapegoating. But kicking Thunra a foot off their blog was height treason, and the highest degree of intellectual dishonesty. Just thought I would throw that in for the fun of name calling. Derogatory labeling, is for the purposes of garbage collection. If you think about it, when we call someone a derogatory name, are we not labeling them in such a way that we can swipe them away, and throw them in the garbage, or so we can disregard them like trash along the road, turn our noses up at them like a pile of dog shit on your lawn. My most famous YouTube video is about just such an issue that affected Sam Harris. Sam became enraged, and a bit irrational, and lashed out, at his detractors for calling him an Islamophob. Most people did not like the video, but few understood it, because the comments lack comprehension, one person I know clearly did understand, but was mad at me for siding with Harris, but from the label of my video one would not know that, and one would have to actually listen and understand my point, yes I can be a real spite, 
I am sorry you thought I was an Islamic apologist. Sorry to disappoint. If you want you can call me an Islamophob. Just don't call Sam an Islamophob. I don't think he gets the joke. You see reality perhaps. The truth is, derogatory labels have little use in a civil dialogue, except as emotionally charged vectors. No matter how meaningful they seem, labels hold no tangible values in and of themselves. I have become aware of the emotional vectors of labels, as people have called me names, like troll, liar, dumbass, idiot. I could respond by hiding behind a victim term like dyslexia, but I know enough to know that is a meaningless label that is as meanness as ADHD everyone wants to label it. If only they can label it they can understand it, they they can handle it. But the truth is, labels are great, cognitive shorthand. However, sometimes you have to know more of the story. Sometimes, you have to go deep. Sometimes we'll need to understand that not all apples are the same. A wine sap apple really is different from a red delicious. And it really is not a distinction without a difference as I like to say. Yes, we have to label things. But if you think about how our label makes you feel you might be surprised by how labels manipulate your emotions. And if you are not aware of it, you become a puppet of your emotions, your rational mind trying to make sense of it through ad hoc confabulations. Only by understanding our emotional responses can we hope to become better communicators. So say I in censorship, a label is the first step. Once we have our label, the next step is our juicy justification process, and then censor those that fit that label, or have already been labeled as such, and for good measure apply by association. As Russell Glasser of Atheist Experience fame, demonstrated for me, it went like this. I thought the subject was good, but I think we need to be careful with the block button, because I think you're sending the wrong message when you do, it's about open communication, I think Corinne Straw and a car girl writes what Emma has the best rap on this issue, if you are worried about trolls I got your back I eat trolls for lunch, dinner and breakfast. And he replied. Girl writes what would think that. She's one of the sort of people the block button exists for. Okay I use her because she is considered controversial, but she is extremely articulate and well-reasoned person, and to block her is like blocking PBS. I was blown away and I said as much in my next reply. And to this I say wow, sorry you think that that is incredibly intolerant, but it's good that I know that is how you feel, perhaps one day you will reconsider your beliefs. Good luck to you. So because all comments have to be approved by Russell I had to wonder if he would allow it. Russell does not allow the reply and instead does something even worse. Mark, your additional concerns are heard and noted. However, in accordance with the points made in my talk, I'm not going to turn this comment section into a lengthy slugfest about this topic. I thought I would see if he would reconsider so I sent a third comment. Thanks very much for further demonstrating to me your lack of understanding of community by blocking my last comment, which was meant to be a terminal comment, aka good luck to you and spinning it as if I am an unreasonable person, which is deceitful. Wisely he did not reply. Now I have sat on this story for some time, but recently another censorship issue, dealing directly with the atheist experience, came to light. Matt inadvertently made me aware of the issue, thanks to the fact that YouTube and your Google Plus profile are now connected. Matt can be very persuasive, in writing and in speech, and I find him to be mostly rational, so I was willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, but something struck me as odd, and then I realized what it was, it was a censorship issue, buried in Matt's explanation was this, Q&A question 3, comments on your channel are disabled, this is censorship, and I only want to watch the atheist experience in a venue that is unmoderated, answer, YouTube comments are indeed disabled in our channel, however. Let me spare you his juicy rationalization here. Some may agree with Matt's justification no doubt, but most YouTubers have learned the hard way. To do this, is like labeling your video propaganda, given everything in context, specifically Russell's censorship propaganda, in his YouTube video on social media. It's hard for me to believe it is anything other than fear-mongering censorship propaganda. I know, I know, labels, but the dealies, sometimes, we need to wrap it up, with a fitting label. And my personal favorite one is, Fearmongerer.